My name is Ross Lewin. I'm the Associate Vice President for International Affairs, and I want to heartily welcome you all to the University of Maryland. You have come here today to represent the diaspora, a community of people who live outside their country of origin or ancestry, but who remain deeply connected to it. The United States was founded as a land of immigrants and has always owed its success to those who have come from faraway places. Even today, we have over 62 million first and second generation immigrants in the United States who make some of the greatest contributions to developing our economy and for generating goodwill across the world. Your visit to the University of Maryland today represents an extraordinary opportunity for our students, faculty, and staff to meet with diaspora leaders and local community organizations. They will surely learn more about ways to engage with your issues and to get involved with your organizations and with the upcoming Global Diaspora Week that will commence in just 10 days' time. The University of Maryland appreciates the importance of diaspora. With its proximity to one of the world's great national capitals, the University of Maryland understands that we live in a world where boundaries are increasingly blurring while national attachments still abide. We understand that our responsibility includes facilitating researchers to find solutions to the vexing problems currently facing our planet and to develop, to develop our students to make a positive impact around the globe in the future. We understand that our community must be able to appreciate what it is like to walk in another person's shoes, regardless of where they come. We know that diversity is less our challenge and more our strength. And to this end, we believe that a great university must be a globally connected one. As one example of our commitment to internationalization, the University of Maryland is pleased to welcome Dr. Robert Orr as our new Dean of the School of Public Policy. Dr. Orr, who will be starting on the second day of Global Diaspora Week, October 13th, comes to us from the United Nations where he served as a sick Assistant Secretary General for Strategic Planning. In this role, he designed and built significant international institutions, including the UN Global Counterterrorism Center, the UN Peacebuilding Commission, and the UN Human Rights Council. Dr. Orr's most recent academic position was Executive Director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs in the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Dr. Orr has already made clear that he is committed to enhancing the schools and universities' internationalization efforts. We would not be benefiting from your visit to our campus without the help of many organizations. I therefore want to thank all of those involved in creating the Diaspora Tour, including the US, State Department, uh, US Department of State, USAID, and the International Diaspora Engagement Alliance. I would also like to thank our university co-sponsors of this event, including the Center for the History of the New America, which is largely dedicated to learning more about your experiences, the College of Arts and Humanities, and the School of Public Policy. I'd also like to give a special shout out to a School of Public Policy alumna, Sarah Gallagher, for her work in connecting this event back to her alma mater and for her tireless effort in coordinating this event. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to you Professor Bonnie Thornton Dill, Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities. Professor Thornton Dill is a renowned scholar who studies the intersection of race, class, and gender in the United States with a particular emphasis on African American women, work, and families. Her prodigious scholarship has, published, has been published in numerous collections and edited volumes. Prior to assuming the position of Dean, Professor Thornton Dill cha chaired the Women's Studies Department for eight years. In addition, she co-founded on our campus two nationally recognized research centers, the Center for Research on Women at the University of, Memf uh, uh, at the University of Memphis and the Consortium on Race, Gender, and Ethnicity. Dean Thornton Dill serves as the chair of the Advisory Board of Scholars for Ms. Magazine, is the past president of the National Women's Studies Association, and a past vice president of the American Sociological Association. Professor Thornton Dill has received recognition as an outstanding scholar, teacher, and mentor 
through the Jesse Bernard Award and the Distinguished Contributions to Teaching Award given by the American Sociological Association. The University System of Maryland Board of Regents award, uh, have awarded her for mentoring and as the Stanley Kelly Jr. Visiting Professor for Distinguished Teaching in the Department of Sociology at Princeton University. Please join me in welcoming Professor Thornton Dill. Thank you, Ross. I thought this was just going to be a name and title introduction, so uh, <laughs> I'm feeling a little. But I want to add my words of welcome to uh, Ross's welcome. We're really thrilled to have this opportunity to have this event here on the campus at the University of Maryland. One of the things um, Ross has said, I think, uh, just about everything that should be said about the university. I want to highlight just a couple of things about the College of Arts and Humanities and why we're so excited and thrilled to be participating in this and why we feel it's so appropriate to our mission and what we are trying to do. Because we are trying to um, create students who are not only creative innovators and critical thinkers, but who are compassionate communicators. And part of that ability to be compassionate really grows out of what we try to do with them in terms of exposing them and steeping them in issues of cultural difference, cultural communication, language, literature, all of those things that help them understand and empathize with people's experiences from all over. We're also very engaged as a college in community engagement and in pushing the ideas and the scholarship and the work of the arts and humanities out into the community and showing how it is a useful um, tool for working with groups. And so we have been uh, very, in, and when you get communi community engagement in this, around this campus, community engagement is with uh, diaspora communities. Um, we've had some very exciting, we started this just this past year, we launched um, an, uh, a project called the Foxworth um, um, Creative Enterprise Initiative, and we had three courses of students who were working in communities. One group of students worked with um, uh, students from a Latin American youth group and worked with them in terms of telling their stories. Another group worked with Salvadorian immigrants in terms of telling their stories, narrative, and they did a big presentation at the Smithsonian. So we believe in stories. We believe in narrative. We believe people's stories are important. We want our students to learn from the stories that people share. We want them to share their own stories and to help people help people exchange their stories and the, their ideas so that they can learn more about each other. And that is why we are particularly pleased and delighted to be a part of this event, to be helping to co-sponsor it, and to hope, and we look forward to opportunities for more exchange and engagement with this diaspora tour because it is very much a part of our mission as in the College of Arts and Humanities. So I thank you all for being here, and it's my opportunity and privilege to pass the, the um, podium on and to do now. I was told to do a brief introduction, so I'm going to do just what I was told to do um, and bring to the podium uh, Andrew O'Brien, who's Special Representative for Global Partnerships for the U.S. Department of State and really heading up this tour. So, Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, Dr. Thornton Dill. Briefer is better, that's what I say. So thanks for keeping it brief. And I want to thank, um, thank you and uh, Dr. Lewin and, and the university for the warm welcome here. Um, it's, it's a great crowd and a lot of energy. Uh, and, and we were very excited to come. So thank you for, uh, for the welcome, Matt. And I do have to say that as a colleague, Bob Orr, uh, is going to be a remarkable addition to the university, so you're very lucky to have him. So, um, so good luck to everyone. I also want to, uh, where's Lori? Lori Edberg is here from Senator Mikulski's staff. Um, so uh, for, I'll get into this in a minute, but for many years prior to this job, I was um, Secretary, then Senator Kerry's state director. So I was uh, Senate district staff like Lori. So she's very busy, so thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. And Mary Kane, where did Mary go? There's Mary. Mary is the president of Sister Cities International, 
Um, so thank you for coming today. Mary is one of our great partners in this effort and a lot of things we do uh, at the Global Partnerships Office. So, um, so we have um, great representation all around from our partners. Um, so <clears throat> before I sort of get into why we're all here, uh, I want to explain sort of why I'm here. And for many years, as I mentioned when I introduced Lori, um, I worked in state and local government. To about 20 years ago, I worked for the mayor of Boston, Tom Menino, who um, got elected 20 years ago, 21 years ago, and only left office a year ago. So I left a long time ago. He kept being mayor. And then after that, I was, uh, as I mentioned, I was state director for the senator. And now I'm in um, the State Department as a special representative for global partnerships. And I can tell you that um, all of the things that I did in each of those stages are, uh, are connected in a lot of ways. The work is very much the same, and it's all about connecting with people and connecting people. And Dr. Thornton Dill, you, thank you for sort of mentioning that idea that, about stories, because I think this diaspora tour and the work we're trying to do, I think um, it captures what are uniquely American stories that every one of us has at some level. And um, so thank you for sort of singling that out. I hope that we sort of live true to that uh, throughout the course of this tour and the work we do beyond. In the 20 plus years that I've been in the public sector, um, one of the things I've come to understand is that creative collaboration with local communities, um, many of whom represent diverse views in our globalizing world, they're so important to the big work, the small work we do. So our office, the Office of Global Partnerships, is the main entry point for creative collaboration between the State Department, the private sector, civil society, NGOs, and universities. Public-private partnerships have become a priority within the U.S. government. They are a critical mechanism for strengthening our diplomatic connections, enhancing our development work, promoting economic growth, and safeguarding our long-term security as a nation. Today, official development assistance from governments and multilateral organizations is no longer the primary driver of economic growth. Foreign investment in developing countries outpaces aid by nearly 10 to 1. In the 1960s, such assistance represented 70% of the capital flows going into developing countries. But today, because of private sector growth and increased trade, domestic resources, remittances, capital flows, it is just 13%. So we have shifted worldwide from a development model that was traditionally based on aid to one moving much more swiftly based on investment. What this all really points to is that no single entity or government on its own is going to be able to provide a solution to the world's biggest challenges, such as climate change, food security issues, access to education, and quality jobs. Together with our partners, we work towards the goal of strengthening and deepening the economic and social development of cities and countries around the world. And in less than five years, our office has been able to build partnerships with over 1,600 organizations and has leveraged more than $829 million in public and private resources for U.S. foreign policy. And our partnerships focus on a wide variety of topics, from strengthening entrepreneurship and innovation to promoting green development. And of course, what brings us here today is one of our marquee partnerships, the International Diaspora Engagement Alliance otherwise known as IDEA, which centers on diaspora community engagement for development in countries and regions of heritage. So you're probably asking yourself, why is the State Department interested in diaspora, and why are we out on this tour? Well, more than 60 million Americans are first-generation or second-generation descendants of immigrants, also known as hyphenated Americans or diasporans. What is unique about these Americans is that they have a special affinity whether through family or cultural ties, to countries all around the world. And through this affinity, they are naturally positioned to engage in development. So as an Irish American myself, I've seen the natural linkage of kinship and friendship between the Irish Americans in many cities throughout the United States and Ireland, and my hometown of Boston is no exceptions. In city and towns across America, diaspora communities are engaging with their countries of origin, whether they're sending money back to relatives through remittances or basic survival needs, investing in local businesses, donating, volunteering, or introducing new technologies. Diaspora communities are often the first movers, beating governments to local challenges, whether it's via humanitarian response 
and exchanging timely information of on-the-ground conditions, or investing in emerging business opportunities. We believe that diaspora communities have the potential to be the most powerful partner an engaged government can bring to the world's table, which is why we launched the IDEA partnership together with USAID back in 2011. Together with private sector partners like Western Union, IDEA promotes and supports creative partnership-driven diaspora initiatives in investment in entrepreneurship, philanthropy, volunteerism, and innovation in countries and regions of origin. Last fall, we partnered with the Calvert Foundation, and Sarah's here from Calvert, she already got her shout out, a not-for-profit financial institution based in Bethesda, Maryland, to manage the IDEA partnership. And this partnership has opened up so many doors on what diaspora engagement could mean, especially through investment channels. Given their nearly 20-year record with their community investment note and a history of 100% rate of return on over $1 billion of investment back to investors, Calvert will launch IDEA investment notes that target specific countries so that any individual or organization can invest as little as $20 online and as much in the millions towards a specific country's development. So as much of the work on IDEA that we do in Washington, we made a decision early this year to take the work, take this discussion on the road to venues like this, to get the word out on how the State Department is engaging diaspora communities to further our shared development goals. And more importantly, to recognize their tremendous contributions towards development worldwide. Now beyond the stop here at the University of Maryland and other universities, now I was at Ohio State yesterday, so I told them I wasn't going to talk about football there. <laughs> Not going to talk about football today. Uh, so we're stopping here. We're at Ohio State. Um, we're actually encouraging beyond the tour uh, some dialogue and action around diaspora engagement. And that's particularly during the week of October 12th through 18th, during which we are launching our first ever Global Diaspora Week. So what is great about universities like the University of Maryland is not only do you have self-organized student diaspora organizations, but you have the energy and creativity and those stories, Dr. Thornton Dill, that is needed in America's development efforts. So I encourage everyone in the audience to uh, yourself or through your networks, through the university itself, to possibly sign up and host an event that week. They can be anything from a fundraiser for an NGO doing development work overseas, to a roundtable discussion or a talk like this that is tailored to your specific diaspora interests, or maybe even a Google Hangout with students from another university so you can chat with the other schools about work you might be able to do during winter break, summer break, uh, other breaks. Um, so Connie's here right in front. Adam is in the back. Um, Sarah, getting your third shout out of the talk already. Uh, <laughs> And it mentions here that you're a Maryland alum, so I might as well just say it again. You're a Maryland <laughs> alum. Got to buy myself some points after the Ohio State mention. So you can talk to any of them about how um, you might be able to get involved. <clears throat> as Secretary Kerry said in his first speech as Secretary of State, in today's global world, there is no longer anything foreign about foreign policy. I couldn't agree more, and our diaspora communities are living proof of that. In our cities and towns, on our college campuses, you have the power to positively influence and impact communities here and abroad. Whether you are a diaspora individual, part of a larger community, or you simply have an affinity for positive development overseas, you are our grassroots ambassadors, and we welcome your energy, vision, and engagement in amplifying America's development efforts around the globe. Thank you. So, we have, uh, we have a great panel for today. And I'm going to ask you, why don't you come on up, take a seat. Thank you. Uh, Kikanai Punyua, I'm a student here, a uh, senior. Um, Samhar Rayo, the Diaspora African Women's Network. Hello, I'm uh, David Ensor. I'm the director of The Voice of America in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna, this is going to work. Um, we'll do a couple of rounds of questions that I'll ask and um, round robin a little bit, and then we'll 
open up questions to the audience. So um, that'll probably about a half hour for the first part. And the other next part goes. So David, this is your third stop with us right. as a panelist. You and I could take it on the road forever. We, we could, we could. It's been fun. People may not be interested in what we're <laughs> talking about, but um, you work, you're with Voice of America, um, and I think people hear about Voice of America, um, they know about it, but I think you've actually, I don't want to take away your thumb, you the hand showing thing. Why don't you tell us about Voice of America? Why don't you tell us how you got sort of involved in this? Uh, talk about your outreach, talk about what it means um, to, to the, the global world. Well, I, I'm sitting here because uh, the Voice of America basically is a diaspora organization. And I'll expand on that in a second. But can I ask the students in the room to raise their hands if they had heard of Voice of America before uh, seeing this notice and coming to this event? You have heard of it. Okay, because when I go around and say, hi, I'm David Ensor, the director of the Voice of America, I commonly get uh, these two responses. Older people say, oh, yes, right. Uh, a Cold War organization, is it still going? Uh, and younger people say, um, yeah, I think I've heard of it. What is it, though? Um, well, let me tell you what it is. It's a, um, a US-funded, United States government-funded, international broadcasting organization, broadcasting in 45 languages, reaching 164 million people each week. 164 million. We're one of the largest broadcasting organizations in terms of reach on the planet. But most Americans, the taxpayers who fund us, either have never heard of us or don't really know what we're about because we've never had a mandate to broadcast in this country. And in fact, until about a year ago, it was illegal for our programs to even be seen and heard here. That was changed, I'm happy to say. And so now there are radio stations around, most of them run by diaspora organizations that do broadcast. We, uh, when we were in Florida, I, I was checking and I found there was a, over a dozen radio stations that broadcast the, uh, the VOA Creole service news broadcasts around Florida. Um, and at, because of the change in the law last year, we're starting to accumulate more and more stations, mostly radio, but also television sometimes, that broadcast our, our uh, services. And if you go on the internet, you can go, we've got something like 60 websites. Most of them you can, you can stream, you can listen to a stream of our broadcasts. So we reach a tremendous number of people and we have a charter that Congress passed in 1976 that, that uh, instructs us by law to uh, broadcast news and to attempt to make it as objective, balanced, and comprehensive as possible to explain the United States, its people, its policies, the ups and downs, and to present uh, U.S. foreign policy and responsible views thereon. So within those three tasks, that's basically what we do. And one of the reasons I'm coming around with, with, with Drew and the group here and talking to audiences is I want, we all need to have more Americans understand what we're doing. And in particular, I want to speak, have a chance to reach out to diasporas, people who are first or second generation Americans who care still not only about this country, but also about their country of origin and, and the plight of or the, the situation, the life of people in those countries. Uh, many of you are more likely to know about the Voice of America than perhaps other Americans. Um, and frankly, I'm kind of here making a plea for support because, uh, because the, because the uh, Voice of America is not that well known in the United States, um, it's not that often that Americans uh, make the case for it to their elected representatives and to other uh, people who, you know, key stakeholders, if you will. And we want to have, we're hoping to have a relationship with diaspora organizations in this country. We cover uh, the life of diaspora organizations and of diasporas in this country as a matter of interest to their own uh, co, co the people who speak the same language as they do somewhere else in the world. So, for example, uh, we have a large Farsi service that broadcasts six hours of fresh television every day in Farsi to Iran. There are 800,000 Farsi speakers in the state of California alone. What they're up to, what they think, what they're doing is of great interest to, uh, to Iranians. So we try to do uh, a, a good job of broadcasting the news about what's happening in that diaspora community, large, powerful, important. Um, and we try to give a very, very 
uh, balanced and objective broadcast to Iran, a country where, uh, quite frankly, if we weren't doing it, there aren't too many other places that are. The state broadcasters certainly are not. So that's maybe a, a longish introduction and answer to your, to your question as to what is the Voice of America and what are, why am I here? No, that's good. You caught up on your introduction, too. So. <laughs> Samar, I'm going to ask you, um, we'll come right down the line. Oh, okay. Okay. And you, it's your opportunity to do a shameless plug for your organization. And I know you like that. <laughs> so your organization is Dawn, and it has, uh, it has very impressive and diverse um, membership and country representation. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Dawn, why you started it, and then talk particularly about women and girls yeah. and in the context of that. So uh, I started an organization called the Diaspora African Women's Network, or Dawn. And what it is is essentially a professional association, membership-based, of diaspora women who work on African affairs. So in many ways, it's a very straightforward sort of professional network. But it's a little bit more than that because of who our members are and what we're trying to do. Um, as an organization, I started it after spending three years living and working in Eritrea. I'm the daughter of Eritrean immigrants, born and raised in the States. And I grew up with a very close affinity with Eritrea's struggle for independence as a child and when it became a nation, um, my first job was to work for Eritrea in its rebuilding. So as a young professional, I went back to Eritrea and saw it for the first time, I think, when I was a teenager. But my first job after law school was to give back. And so for three years, I went to Asmara throughout the country, dealing with the peace process, trying to give a part of my own service, if you will. Um, and then I returned to the States when the process was over. My work was done. And I realized that I had this relationship with not only the country, but with the continent. And I had a relationship with the United States that I thought were very important. And my role was quite unique, just because I had grown up in such a bicultural household, a bicultural experience, transnational experience. And I was looking for ways to leverage that. So when I got back from Eritrea and I worked on the Hill, and I actually worked with Voice of America and others, so it's nice to see things come full circle, I started to realize how many other people from immigrant communities and how many other people from diaspora communities are doing the same thing. A lot of um, Iranian Americans, Arab Americans, um, at the time Sudan, when Sudan Darfur conflict was raging, a lot of um, Sudanese groups were coming to the Hill, were coming to Congress. So it was born out of a policy framework of how, as a constituency, you raise issues in international affairs. But then I started to realize that we are much more um, integrated into Africa's development and prosperity beyond sort of advocacy in that sense and beyond remittances. So the organization initially started as a network of women working on the Hill, working in DC, working on African affairs. It is now over 300 women representing 38 African countries, plus the United States, Latin America, Caribbean, Middle East, Europe. It really is just a network of, of African diaspora women, and it's self-identification. We, uh, we don't go into the space of trying to argue who's a diaspora and who's an African diaspora. I think it's self-identified. And so working from that space, we really are trying to cultivate the next generation of women leaders a next generation of diasporas uh, that are contributing to Africa's growth, but also contributing to U.S. engagement to the host, the host countries that we're in. We have women in uh, London and Geneva. We have actually we now have a member who lives in China, so she works for uh, uh, some you know some organization, but she's now ba based in Beijing, and so our network continues to grow. And the idea is that we can establish partnerships not just with governments or grassroots communities, but everything in between, everything with businesses and organizations and communities and associations. And there can be a stronger partnership between civil society on the ground, diaspora, <coughs> and wherever decision makers sit in all levels. Um, that's Thank you. Yeah. I don't think I asked you this before. What year did your parents come ah, to the U.S.? So here's a great, here's a great thing. They came in 1968 as a part of the... Um, during the Kennedy administration, um, the same time Obama's dad came. And my parents came separately for school. My dad was 17, he was in high school. Um, and they went to the University of Michigan, um, went all over. But by the mid-70s, they couldn't go back home. 
And so it was one of those situations where they didn't really expect to move completely to the United States. They expected at that time there was a whole generation of African students, uh, cultural exchange, educational exchange programs, and they came to the United States intending to go back. And when they couldn't, I actually, they actually became quite involved in doing advocacy for Eritrea's struggle for independence. So I was born into that sort of Afro hippie <laughs> activism. Um, and, and I think that's a little bit of why this is happening now with organizing. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Kakani, we'll go to you. So you're a, you're a senior here, University right. of Maryland. You're an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm gonna let you, it'll be your opportunity for the shameless plug for your organization. I want you to talk about it, and I want you to talk about how it impacts um, life back home in your village at home, how it, uh, how it impacts women and girls also. Thank you. Uh, well, my story kind of started, as uh, she said, her father came uh, when, she, when he was 17. I came here when I was 17, just a while ago, uh, as an exchange. Not that long ago. <laughs> But uh, I was an exchange student uh, in 2009. Uh, I came with FS. I don't know how many people heard about American Field Service. Uh, I was hosted just 30 minutes away from here at uh, Wild Lake High School. Uh, and then from there, that's how I, I started getting involved with um, a lot of issues that I saw back home in Kenya. Because you know, growing up in Kenya, I saw so much challenges that I faced by uh, mostly women and girls. Uh, so uh, when I came here, I saw a chance to uh, give back to the people that I left behind and also kind of uh, being a leader to uh, inspire other young leaders to come up to, uh, to come with solution to, to, to face the challenges. So my senior year at Glenelg Country School, uh, we had a community action project. So my teacher told us, you can do anything from local, international, whatever you're interested. Uh, so that's when the opportunity came in and I decided that, uh, you know what, I'm gonna raise money to build a clinic for, the, for my village uh, because I saw a need for women to have a place to give birth, which is not far because a lot of challenges I saw was, we have midwives, but they, they don't have a knowledge of how to, uh, to do what they are supposed to do. So uh, having a clinic nearby with nurses and professional, I thought that would be the most uh, immediate thing I can, I can do. Uh, so with the resources that I had from Glenelg Country School, it's a small private school in Cow County, uh, really gave me uh, motivation to go ahead and just do it. So, with the help of my teacher, Mr. Weeks, who is uh, the, the teacher at Glenelg Country School, he really helped me grow and helped me uh, meet different people and also helped me fundraise. And we kind of decided that we should raise money and whatever amount we get, we spend to build the construction so that it just grow by whatever much we get. So last year we were able to raise $15,000 and we were able to complete the construction of the clinic. Uh, so right now we are projected by beginning of next year, we should be able to have doctors and all the equipment ready for operation. So that's exciting. So, um, Thank you, thank you. So through high school and then to college, I, I saw that you know the, the clinic is already about to be done. So how are we gonna sustain the clinic? And my goal was to empower women and give them uh, equipment, you know, like equip them with resources they need because there are so many challenges they face, uh, mostly in my tribe. I'm originally from the Maasai tribe. And the Maasai tribe is, uh, have this tradition of just women oppression. So the women are not the leaders of the family. They do a lot of choices to take care of the, the kids and uh, they don't really have a voice in, in our society. So my goal was to give them voice and also to give them the resources they need to be able to do, to step up to the challenge. So I decided that I will take advantage of the fact that we have women with a lot of skills in the village and then take those skills to kind of find a way to bring income to them as a source of income. So most women in my village are known for making beads. Um, 
this was this is shameless plug opportunity. I think you should have done this five minutes ago. So, uh, beats like this. So I took the fact that they know how to make these beats, and then why not take this as a way to uh, get them to earn income? And that's how I started Rafiki Beats just a year ago. So they make this uh, product, and I bring it here and sell, and the profit will go back to them. So so far, we already have 30 women employed, but the demand is so high that we need to. Uh, balance between demand and supply because if we supply we have to have the demand on this side so it's been uh, it's been growing and uh, it's been going really well I'm excited to share that journey with you guys thank you every time no every time we've done this with all due respect to my more mature colleagues every time we have a student up here it makes me rethink my life <laughs> so, very well done Merle we talked, Dr. Thornton Dill talked about stories, and I mentioned stories, and um, there are, I think, opportunities in, in this larger diaspora discussion to talk, and I don't think we do it enough to talk about arts and culture, um, even sports, about things that link people beyond, um, uh, beyond sort of the typical, and we talk a lot about investment in business here. Um, you, um, poetry and research and uh, the work you do, um, can you talk about its, its effect and its impact on the Caribbean diaspora and, and some of the work you do? Thank you. Okay, so I introduced myself um, as a professor here at the University of Maryland. So let me talk a little bit about how that links with my work with diaspora organizations. A few years ago, I was teaching a play, a Caribbean play to my ENGL 362. That's my class, Caribbean literature class in the English department. And what struck me then was that although, you know, it went fantastically in the classroom, I kept thinking it would be so great to see this on stage um, within the community. And that's how uh, we started uh, Caribbean Community Theater. And I, you know, I began like this because it certainly has something to do with my own interest in poetry, my own interest in writing, in theater, etc. So I started uh, Caribbean Community Theater, which put that play. Uh, written by a Guyanese writer on stage. It was a play discussing uh, AIDS in the community. And I thought, you know, we needed it for more than the, uh, the primary research. For more than the research, we also needed to take it to the community um, and have people discuss it there. And let me step back a little to say that um, my own journey was from the Caribbean, I was born in the Caribbean, grew up on the Caribbean island of Grenada. I say it like that because although I've often seen it written that I was born in Grenada, it's not true. <laughs> I was born in Aruba, grew up on the Caribbean island of Grenada. And after that, studied in Jamaica, then here in the United States, I first came to the US in 1981. Um, studied here, returned to Grenada, uh, and it was here uh, in the US really as a graduate student that I first started focusing on a lot of the writing of poetry. And that was as an immigrant looking back, thinking about home. And I remember the first poem that I wrote and left on paper here in Silver Spring, where I was living as a student in an apartment there at the time, was a poem called Neighbor String. Um, Neighbor String, translated from the Caribbean Creole, is umbilical cord. Uh, and essentially the poem said, the part of me that is there, not here, home, not wandering, not, hey, how you doing, but doo doo darling, you all right? not going up to this enclosed home in the elevator, on stairs, etc. So, you know, in a sense, that poem then is exploring that entire experience of being an immigrant and trying to understand the immigrant reality right around. So that was the beginning. Um, well, that was one of the beginnings. 
And from there, I've always been interested in exploring um, poetry on the page, poetry in performance, poetry um, in print, and the particular experiences of migrant communities. Uh, and so I've been using, um, constantly been using words uh, and particular organizational activity, and perhaps I'll talk about that a little more later on, and particular organizational activity to engage with the experiences of um, migrants uh, here and also connecting that with the home experience. While you have the mic and while you brought up Grenada, um, let's go right back. Another question, can you talk about uh, your role in Grenada's library project and, and the importance of that to researchers uh, and, and this work in the diaspora? Okay, um, in fact, I'll talk about uh, my role in the library project and also uh, an organization that I started before that, uh, an organization called Caravision Community Theater. And I mentioned Caravision earlier when I talked about teaching a play and then immediately after that, uh, going out to the Caribbean community and beginning a group there. In fact, I see one of the members of the group here today, so it's wonderful to see that. But um, uh, hello, Althea. <laughs> um, yes, when this organization, Caribbean Community Theater, was started, we were interested not in having uh, different sort of island groups. We thought, yes, there's a place for that, but we also want to have an organization that is Caribbean. Um, and we said Caribbean at the time, intending it also to be Anglophone, Francophone, Hispanophone, to break down those um, divisions that we always work with. Um, so far, because our direct contacts in the community have been largely Anglophone, it has developed as a group focusing really on the Anglophone Caribbean, but we want to move beyond that. Uh, in addition, and Caribbean Community Theater has put on plays here at the University of Maryland and also at various high schools uh, in the community. Um, we started with the discussion of that, of AIDS, and moved on to, this, to a discussion of folk theater generally, and um, we have lots of ideas for developing that further. But in addition to that, quite recently, uh, Grenada's library, the library in my home country, Grenada, uh, was closed. Um, that happened in 2012. And you know, from looking at it from here, we might say, okay, one library is closed, what's that? But when the library is closed, we're talking about the public library, um, and we're talking about the library system that I used as a high school student, uh, the place where I met many researchers, and I can mention, for example, you know, meeting, that's where I met Pedro Noguera, who is now at NYU. Um, Pedro was at the time researching Caribbean post-emancipation and other stories. Um, Edward Cox, that, you know, I met, I'm just mentioning researchers to show that yes, the library is important for the local situation, it is also important internationally. So I talked to other people who were quite disturbed that the public library, and remember I'm emphasizing that because what this means is that at the moment there is no public library facility in St. George's, the capital of Grenada. And that's a result of Hurricane Ivan, which we know took place so many years ago, 2004. Um, it remained open for a while, although it was damaged until about 2011, and since then, it has been closed. So I started an organization here called Grenlib, um, Grenada Libraries, Archives, uh, Facilities Support Group, intended to support the efforts being made in Grenada, uh, both to repair the library and for training of um, archivists and librarians uh, to run the facility. To date, I've, in coordination with other people in the organization, we've talked to 
uh, to Pat Heron here at the university, to librarians in DC, simply trying to get advice. I went to a presentation of international archivists at Reading University in order also to talk about this and to seek support, and basically it's support for training. Um, and we're also doing fundraising to assist with the repair of that facility because it's, of course, totally disturbing that young high school students, et cetera, uh, don't have that facility. Very good, thank you. That's great. Samar, since you've got the other mic, we'll just go with you. Um, you uh, so you talked very um, eloquently about your experience as a diasporan and your parents' experience, and um, you've talked very passionately about some of the work that you've done. So you could have, you had a, obviously had a long interest in this, and you could have gone to work for an NGO, you could have gone to work for government, you could have gone, but you actually chose your own route. You've been very entrepreneurial about this, started a few things. Um, why don't you talk about how you came to that decision to go that route, and then some of the pros and cons along the way. So, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm convinced that diasporas, and particularly the African diaspora, we're, we're natural entrepreneurs, and that's largely because we're already very active in our communities. And so the idea of organizing, of grassroots, of community service is such an intrinsic part of our existence. I was working in government, and I was working in NGOs while uh, managing Dawn. This is seven years now. So in 2007 uh, till 2012, I was spending half my time on the continent, also working full, you know, back and forth. But it became very clear to me that that isn't sustainable in, in terms of impact and change. And so made the tough decision to walk away from my, uh, the career that I had kind of convinced my parents I needed to do. You should have heard my dad when I told him I, I was gonna be a lawyer, but I was gonna work for a peace process at virtually for free. And you know, he said, you could be making so much money as a corporate lawyer and you wanna work for free. I mean, it was, it was undoing sort of the immigrant dreams, right, of coming all this way and going to school and all this. And I said, just wait, you'll see. And a few years later, uh, at an airport, a congressman stopped me and started asking me about all this foreign policy things. And my parents couldn't register that, that, that they wanted to spend their time asking me questions. And they started to realize how you have influence, how you can make impact. It's, it doesn't have to be in the box. And so I, I sensitized them to that. And then I took the leap. And I left my work to do this entrepreneurial uh, venture, but not in a for-profit way that we often think of, but in that social entrepreneurship way. And continuing to find ways to help communities, support them, strengthen our roles, but also amplify our contributions in, in, in a meaningful way. I'm also from Minneapolis, which is very active immigrant uh, community, uh, Somali Americans, Eritreans and Ethiopians, whatnot, Liberians, Kenyans, everyone, Hmong, it's just, it goes on. But there, we have a really neat sort of microcosm of decision makers who care, businesses that want to work with us, community organizations that are open, and active uh, members of, of local communities. And there's this beautiful marriage happening at a local level and state, and now federal, where Minnesotan uh, contributions are sort of deep across different diaspora communities. And two examples, we hosted, Dawn hosted a conference with, as part of Global Diaspora Forum a couple of years ago, where we brought together different diaspora communities to talk about philanthropy. The communities that showed up were not African. They were everyone. We had Norwegian Americans, uh, Mexican Americans, uh, African, and across, across the, the whole world. And we were learning best practices from each other. And that's the type of entrepreneurial venture that I think we need. And I think that diasporas are actually um, naturally skilled at, intuitively skilled at, because of our existence in this transnational way. And the other one, which is reminding me because of Sister Cities, it was through Minneapolis and the diaspora communities, and uh, in, in this case, Congressman Ellison, that this idea to help support a library project in Mogadishu came to fruition. And it was between Minneapolis and Mogadishu, between the diasporas and the decision makers, between organizations like Sister Cities that promote this sort of fostering, that diasporas were active change agents. I was at the, where the conversation started was on a panel like this. And within a month or two, the library project had been launched. So I, those are some neat examples of, 
what entrepreneurial um, ventures would mean as a diaspora and why I left is I always tell people Dawn was born out of a necessity. This is not what I thought I would be doing, but it's what I have to be doing. It's needed. And it's, it's actually, it's, what it's doing is introducing what already is here. We've already got skilled, amazing diaspora actors who are busy, and I guess my job is to bring that to the forefront and show people all the different ways that we're contributing. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, David, <clears throat> uh, this, could be, this could be a question um, this could be a question for your staff. You have a remarkable staff at VOA. But I actually think it's a question that, that you could yourself add a lot to. The, the things that make people scatter, um, genocide, war, poverty, restrictions on human rights, um, the things that cause people to be diasporans. I think you've probably, you and your staff have seen some of these things up close. Um, I wonder if you could talk yeah. maybe anecdotally about some of that. We, we've seen them up close. We are seeing them up close right now. Um, we have journalists in harm's way uh, in northern Nigeria reporting about the activities of Boko Haram. Uh, we have journalists in uh, Guinea and uh, uh, Liberia uh, reporting on, on the tragic story uh, that's un, un, uh, unfolding right now of the Ebola uh, uh, disease that is spreading so, 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 so frighteningly in Western Africa. And um, we have reporters, or we did last week in Minnesota, um, looking in from our Somali service, uh, learning more about some of the young men that have made the unfortunate choice of going to Syria to fight for ISIL, or ISIS, as it's known, uh, and getting, trying to get a better understanding of how does the Somali community get its arms around this? What is it going to do? What are the leaders of the Somali community in Minnesota going to do about the fact that some of their young sons are going to die for a cause that, as far as most of us can see, looks like a criminal thug organization, and little more than that, wrapped up as, as Islam in a false flag. So uh, Vo Voice of America reports on those kinds of stories uh, to the world. I put our journalism uh, on the Ebola crisis right now unfolding up against any news organization. Um, I'm afraid some of my people have taken greater risks than almost anyone else. And there's some, of the fam some of the human stories that they are telling about how small villages in Liberia cope with this terrifying thing that has come about, um, I hope will bring, uh, will, will, will alight the conscience of the world uh, in a way that certainly President Obama has, has gotten, it's gotten his attention, uh, this crisis. I hope many more leaders will, will come up to the plate. So I think our reporting uh, helps to shine a light where it needs to be shown. Um, and our, and uh, our knowledge of diasporas and, and languages, not, as, I, as I started by saying, you know, VOA is, is, is like the UN. I mean, you walk down the hallways, there's every language. Uh, 50 radio studios, uh, it's about 20 television studios, every possible language being spoken in them. We have deeper knowledge than almost any other organization in this country, or news organization certainly, about certain parts of the world. I mean, particularly expert um, in areas where we have large audiences and large diasporas. Um, Africa has more than a third of our audience, and probably a lot of our growth potential as well. So I'm happy to take questions on specifics. And while I've got the microphone, let me just mention that I have three colleagues with me here. So folks who might be interested in knowing more about VOA or about student internships there or other things, two graduates of the University of Maryland, uh, right over here, Bruna and Sahail. Could you just hold your hands up for a second? And, and Steve McGinley is somewhere here too, back in the back. So we're happy to take questions afterwards if, if you're interested in VOA. Yeah, we'll have an opportunity. I didn't mention this from the outset. We'll spend a few minutes. Those of you who want to have questions for any of us or uh, any of the State Department staff, happy to stick around for a few. So. Um, Kikani, so I, I had a similar experience with a student yesterday, also in Ohio State. So you, you, you're clearly very passionate about this um, and committed, and I, I didn't want to make light of it before by saying I should revisit my life, but I should probably. But, um, you know, you could be doing other things right now, but you're, you're doing, not only you're finishing your degree, but you're at it and you're trying to improve things at home. Why don't you talk about for a minute engaging other students or people your age or other diasporans and, and talk about some of the, the pluses of that and some of the minuses of that. Thank you. Well, uh, <clears throat> being a, an ath uh, student and then also I'm an athlete. Uh, What's your sport? 
track and field. I'm from Kenya, so like. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure. <laughs> It's actually it's funny because how I got involved with track was... What's your, what's your event? How's that? Just track and field. 400 uh, meters, 800 meters? No, I mean, <laughs> middle distance and uh, about 5K. 5K? Yeah. Um, okay. But it's funny because when I came here as, a, as an exchange student, I, I, when I was staying with my host family, they said, you know, the only way you can make friends uh, really fast was joining a sport. So I was like, you know what, I used to play soccer back home, so why don't you joined uh, the soccer team, but they said, you're from Kenya, you can run, and we know the cross-country coach, so <laughs> the, the Kenya thing has been, uh, it's been going on, but, uh, uh, you know, starting Rafiki Beads was, uh, was definitely something that I'm passionate about, and I would like to help as many people as I can, because I see a need for, uh, for empowerment, and uh, I have to balance between a student and athletics, and then also working uh, to grow Rafiki Beads. So it's been kind of like um, getting my teammates involved, uh, helping me uh, basically sell the products that I have and also help me on social media to spread the word about Rafiki Beads. For instance, uh, this summer, some of my teammates asked if they can sell my bracelet in their uh, camp because some of them work at, as, as camp counselors. So, that kind of really actually helped me uh, because having the network already as a student athlete really helped. Uh, but also classes, uh, I, I go to classes and talk about uh, what I'm doing and people reach out to me and want to be part of it. Uh, for, for example, I have, uh, we have interns or people who are helping me out to, uh, in different roles in Rafiki Beads. They all reach out to me and they say, I want to be part of this and I want to, help uh, whatever you, you want me to do. So uh, it's been kind of a, a, great, a great journey of uh, inspiring young people that uh, the age doesn't matter. You can do anything uh, you, you, you're passionate about, uh, no matter whether it's big or small. Uh, just start small and then you know, you'll get there eventually. But uh, the challenges that I've been facing mostly has been uh, trying to balance between supply and demand because on the other side of Kenya, I have to have people who will be in charge of the women who will be making the, these products. So I, when I was there, which was about a year ago, I selected a uh, couple women who will be overseeing the whole production and then also they will be responsible in paperwork and making sure that everything is running smoothly. So as a young leader, you know, as a young person, it's been a challenge to, you know, get those people to trust you and, and think that, you know, you're actually going to send money to them and, and you know, ABCD. So they'll be looking up to me. So it's a really big responsibility because I also have to create, um, you know, I should be able to sell the product when I bring it here. So uh, balancing that, making sure that I sell the product they make and then they'll be able to earn the income. It's been a challenge because you know you never know whether you're gonna sell the product or not, uh, and then also shipping has been is, is is very costly to ship from Kenya to here, so that is also uh, another another challenge we're facing. Uh, as we also you know we don't have much income, so we have to balance that. Uh, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so those are some of the challenges we've been facing, uh, but uh, it's been a great journey anyways. It's been, it's been worth it. Thank you. Um, questions from the audience? Who has them? Get the mic out there, Sarah. Thank you. Not going to say anything about how many there were at Ohio State yesterday, but, you know. Just to break the ice here, I'm Joe Skolton. I work in the Office of International Affairs here. Uh, but in my previous life, when I was an academic, <coughs> um, I did a lot of work in Greece. Um, and Greek, as you all know, the, the word diaspora is a Greek word for spreading out of the seeds. Uh, one of the interesting things you used to find when you get up into the villages um, in Greece is that uh, before they joined the EU, is that um, you know there'd be a certain amount of, of sort of decrepitude in the villages. Everybody had gone to the cities, but those who had stayed, you would see. Um, regular houses and such, and then you would see this beautiful, brand new school, or this beautiful, brand new library, 
or maybe a basketball and tennis court, and there'd be a little plaque on the side of it. And it would, be, it would say, uh, donated to the village by the alumni of the village who now live in Sydney, Australia. And so there are all these alumni associations all the, around the world, Greek alumni associations, um, who are then supporting their own village back home. What I'm interested in hearing from all of you about, though, is that when you would talk to the villagers, the people who had stayed, about their American cousins and such, there was always a sort of um, ambiguity or an ambivalence about this. Um, you know, on the one hand, oh, you're an American, you know, do you know my cousin, you know, such and such and such and such a place. But then there would also be a sense of, oh yes, that's my Australian cousin as well, and you know, they're kind of, so I'm just wondering if that's a phenomenon that you've all run across, and if, is, is it a, an ongoing challenge? Um, you know, how does it fit in with your, your calculation with all the work you're doing? Samara, that one's, I, that's I custom made for you too. I think we could both. It's fascinating because the relationship with the diaspora, uh, as an Eritrean, it, it's very close. We've always been very close to each other by virtue of what led us to leave, but also in rebuilding the country. We're seeing similar things with South Sudan and the relationship, but there's also an inherent tension with the fact that some left, right, and, and are seemingly living better, but then you, you have to describe what what it really means to live here. I've spent many times describing what de debt is to my friends. I, li I mean, I would try to explain what credit cards and debt do to you in this country and, and the economy, what it really means. And um, a lot of my friends who have since left, who are now here, really didn't, they now appreciate that this sort of uh, diaspora experience is not as great as I thought it was. And, and actually, there's a really sad nickname that they call us when we go back to Eritrea. It's called Beles. And Bedles is the cactus fruit, the prickly pear, I guess it's called in English. But the fruit of the cactus only uh, shows up, it blossoms in the summer months of June, July, August. And that's, <laughs> that's when we come. So they call us Bedles as a sort of sometimes derogatory, sometimes ad, uh, admiring term. What's happening now is sort of a realization, a two-way of, you know, we're, we're here as your brothers and sisters abroad, um, but we only know so much. Right? And the ones that are, uh, the communities that are inside the country, uh, they're realizing they may not want to be a diaspora. And there's this conversation happening about should we stay, should we go? And yes, we've helped with schools and communities. Um, I'll say this, th that's my experience for my country and, and my life, but for the 53 others, I know that there's different <laughs> spectrums of diaspora relationships, and there's very open doors and very narrow doors. Um, there's, in the case of Philippines, for instance, there's a, you know, half, a, a significant portion of, of Philippines' development relies on diaspora investments, relies on diaspora contributions, right? And the, the government will admit that. Philippine, Filipinos speak about it often, about how some of these expenses and, and budgets are, are more or less covered by diaspora contributions, whereas others, um, it's, it's a tourism industry, you know? But yeah, the relationship is so, uh, vital, and uh, and it's still unpacking. The uh, Connie was nodding her head because Connie's sort of an honorary member of the Greek diaspora because of her husband. <laughs> she knows she knows what you're talking about. <laughs> Anyone else? Sarah's one over here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm an uh, undergraduate student, uh, econ major. Sorry, my, I just got the cold, so voice is like really shaky. <laughs> I have a question for David. So as like being an econ major, I was interested in the, uh, how do you like, um, like did you have to invest the money in the business, like the entrepreneurship that you're talking about? It's not a business, but it's a social entrepreneurship, right? So um, like what are the tax aspects of it and then how do you bring it and then how do you sell it? I, I was just like curious about the technical aspects of those things, and then the other question would be, uh, what were the difficulties that, you know, like at first you had to raise the funds and everything, did you use any, any kind of fellowship, or how did you raise the funds, and all those questions. Yeah, that should be it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, through the foundation, we started raising money uh, through donations. So that's, how, so that's how we raised the $15,000. The Rafiki B, the social enterprise, I put in my own money. I started with my own money. Uh, so I put in 500 and just kind of brought 
like couple bracelet and then share with my friends and sell it and then it kind of grew from there. Uh, so we kind of reinvest back whatever we make back to the to the enterprise and just kind of grow it small. Right now we don't have a big budget, but you know we're still growing. So it kind of just started with my own money and then started selling products and then uh, going from there. Uh, but uh, what was the other question? Tax. Uh, we're still small, so I, I hope to uh, be a nonprofit. Uh, so right now we're not paying taxes, uh, but I hope by you know by end of this year we should be able to decide whether it's to be a nonprofit or a for profit. But I would like to be a nonprofit, but it's a long route to get the tax deductible uh, status. So I have to get lawyers like her to. <laughs> <laughs> to or or your U.S. senator. Or your U.S. senator. So uh, it's, 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 uh, that's one of the challenges we're facing. We would like to be a nonprofit, so hopefully, if we get the right uh, lawyers, we'll be able to make it. What is the price for the shipping and everything? Like, how much? How do you manage the shipping? Um, so, so shipping has been uh, it's been a challenge because it's very expensive. Uh, sorry. All right. So, uh, we've been taking advantage of the fact that I have my teacher who studied with me at Glendale Country School, and he's been going to Kenya every summer. He's been going to my village every summer. So, I take advantage of the fact that he's going, and I. Throughout, before the summer, I'll organize the women to make sure they produce as much as they can. And then when he come back, he bring it with him. Uh, so we've been kind of cutting the cost of shipping through him going back to Kenya. Uh, but right now, the demand here is high. So I have to find a way to ship products. So right now, I've been talking to one of my managers in Kenya of a way to work with uh, DHL, uh, how we can balance that, because you need more product for less cost. So it's like, I'm figuring that out right now. Thanks, I think there's one right back there, Sarah. Okay. Hello, my name is Cheryl Fraser, and I used to be an intern at Voice of America in the English to Africa Services Department with Uncle Ted. I did a segment, <laughs> I did a segment called African Arts and Culture. I don't know if you ever saw that program. Uncle Ted is now retired, Ted Roberts. And um, during that internship experience, I did an under, well, my undergrad was digital media and web technology. During my internship experience, I learned a lot about Africa because I had to spend a lot of time doing a lot of researching. I was actually born in Sierra Leone, West Africa. However, I came here when I was a young child and I have never been back home, so I really, Prior to that experience, I really didn't have that much of um, knowledge base about what's really happening in Africa. And it wasn't even until my cousin just recently came back home that really inspired me more about what was going on with the whole Ebola issue and the educational experience, the, the whole thing with going on, going on in Africa. So when I continued with my internship, it was really good. and. I tried to get a, a job with the Voice of America, and I had to write a paper about you know, what I knew about public policy. And being as though I came from a multimedia background where everything I did was pretty much creative services, I really didn't have that much knowledge base on public policy. However, I'm now working on an MBA in economics, and that has helped me explore a lot more in what's going on around the world in general. And so what I have, the challenge I have as an African growing up in America, in Washington, D.C., is that, you know, a lot of us, you know, we're pretty much overlooked, basically, because, you know, you have the ones who are, were born in America but had the opportunity to travel and learn about the world, whereas though you have the ones who were born in Africa but didn't have the opportunity to travel because of economical you know, experiences or whatever was going on with our family base. And then they kind of put us in this category as an African American. So I've been, you know, my idea of diaspora was, I thought it, it included African Americans because I thought it was Africans who were not in their own 
country anymore, and that was what African American people are. And because I spend so much time with around African Americans, when I walk out here, people don't, you know, they hear me talk, they're like, wow, your accent is, you don't sound like you're an American, but someone else that was born here that gets a chance to travel, they have more of embracing the African culture, like the young lady here who has this opportunity to help, you know, women, you were born in America, but you have more of an African base and you know you have you know you're more embraced as an african than i am who was born in africa who has never been back to my country before so you have a lot of people here who have that issue and then when when we're placed in this box of being an african american i notice and understand and realize the things that african american people go through because when i'm placed in this box i experience it <laughs> And I'm like, you know, Af you know, I was writing a paper about the African diaspora, and I hear you all speaking, but I don't hear anything about African Americans being a part of the African diaspora. So well, how do you? They, they most certainly are, I would say. Yeah, because yeah. I never hear. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, if I can, I introduced the organization as an organization that is for the whole global African diaspora and its self-identification. We have women who represent the African continent, 38 countries, plus Latin America, Caribbean, United States, which means any American woman who believes she's of the diaspora, as well as Europe, multiracial, and so on and so forth. We have a member, as an example, in Dawn, who on the application, the reason you're accepting to Dawn isn't because of your ethnicity, it isn't because of your identity, it's because of your professional focus on Africa, and the reason you're not accepted into Dawn is because, this is a great example for your question, is because of your professional focus. And women who, have, who don't display the African affairs portfolio that we're looking for right now, unfortunately, cannot become a member of Dawn because we're trying to build a cadre of smart professional women like yourself who can apply to VOA and get a job on the Africa desk. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to bring people like you to people like David and show him the resume that they're looking for. Now, to do that, I have to focus on the professional aspect, not the identity, which is why identity is self-identified. It's what, whatever you make it. Now, as an um, Eritrean, as a daughter of Eritrean immigrants raised in the United States, technically I'm African American. But growing up, I very similar experience to you, and the only reason I have an African experience is because Africa's in me, and I tell everyone it is in me. That is my job, to, to introduce myself. And that is Don's job, we introduce ourselves. So for you, as a Sierra Leonean American, as a Sierra Leonean, as an African American, as a woman, as a human being, you're introducing yourself. That box is a problem everyone has. But the box that we carry as women of color in a country where race is a very sensitive issue with socioeconomic challenges, with an economy that is extremely competitive globally, but also uh, in a downturn the last few years, you have to become more smarter and even more creative at how you get noticed. And so that's what we're trying to help you with. The, um, the other area is simply that diasporas, it is, it is what you make it. <coughs> And so um, I hope your internship experience and your MBA are preparing you, but also I hope these conversations are also part of the, the way we introduce ourselves. That's storytelling. You know, I mean, obviously, you, you're speaking to my heart. And I'm speaking to you as some heart, but also as a diaspora woman. People told me I was not black enough. I was not American enough. I was not African enough. I was not Eritrean enough. This hair is African. This face is African, this mouth is American. <laughs> and I know that. And I can, I can get on my African pedestal and speak too long, and I can get on my American pedestal and tell you what you need to hear in two seconds. But that is what it is to be a diaspora. You are in many worlds, and you bring them together. And, and Samara, I would add, and thank you for that, by the way, I would add that sort of larger issue that I raised when I first spoke. It's the affinity thing. It is sort of what you make of it. Um, and it's not easy. I mean, you know, I could speak, we do a fair, our office does a fair amount of work in Northern Ireland on sort of the ongoing peace process, and one of the, th one of the things that brought about peace in, in Northern Ireland was the Irish-American diaspora. They had been engaged sort of in different ways, but political leadership brought them to the table on that process. Now that diaspora, I tell you, and I'm part of it, they sort of struggle with, they struggle with who they are and what they get involved in, which, you know, there's some, you know, They've been established. There's certain degrees of affluence there, but um, there's an identity crisis in people, I think, in diasporans whose families have been around for a few generations. Um, the connections are a little lost. The affinity is what you make of it. That's what I think. It's two over here. 
Thank you very much. I want to thank our speakers. I've really been inspired by uh, your stories. Uh, my name is Janelle O'Clue. I practice immigration law here in Maryland and in DC. Um, I am a member of the African diaspora. I'm originally from Ghana, and I work directly with uh, diasporans from uh, all over the world, uh, Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, Latin America, uh, also North America and the Caribbean. Um, my question actually has to do with international students. I'm particularly interested in uh, international students uh, who come here to the US and study, and somewhere along their, their time here in the US, uh, for many international students, they do return to their home countries after they've completed their studies, but there are also many students who afterwards either desire to stay on in the US and work, or perhaps even want to pursue permanent residence and you know live in uh, the US and become part of the, uh, the, uh, the immigrant community here. Uh, recently, the Brookings Institution uh, published a report on um, international students. And uh, their focus was on the relationship between uh, international students in various metropolitan areas in, in uh, the United States and Washington DC metro area was one of the top five and um, how uh, connections could be made between the international students studying at universities in the metro areas and uh, their home countries. So I would like to know uh, from our uh, international student, as, as well as our uh, professor, our University of Maryland professor, that uh, is that something you encounter, either your peers or students that you teach, who are from other countries who during their time here in the US uh, either consider staying on in the US or want to explore ways in which the education that they've gained here, they can be uh, you know, able to work here in the US and also uh, link back to their home countries. Uh, well, I think I can begin by speaking of my very long ago experience as an international student here, um, because that's where it started. I was an international student, of course, um, returned to my home country, came back to the US, left again, so it was a you know, very much a back and forth. Um, and there was always that, during that period, there was always that connection with the home country and with other international students who were in other countries. And speaking as a professor here now, um, I know that I have a particular interest in um, working with both people within the community and with international students who are making those connections to the home country. In fact, there is a course uh, that during next semester, spring 2015, um, I will be teaching in coordination with someone at Birmingham University uh, in the UK. And it's a course on oral histories um, of the Caribbean and Latin America because he is in the Department of Hispanic Studies and I'm here in English. Uh, and we are going out into the community, working with people in the community, um, international students and, other, and people in community organizations, collecting their stories, uh, having them analyze and write up their stories. They are the ones doing the writing. In a sense, this is about using stories for, yes, recording of the histories, empowerment, discussing those kinds of experiences, etc. And because of that interest in working with words, um, that is where I am in my engagement, both with community and international organizations. It's a, it's a course, in fact, that will be taught over three semesters. Uh, and it's entitled Oral Histories of the Caribbean and Latin America. Um, and already we have, uh, in a pilot run last semester, we had interest from two people who live in the area, who are international students and who wanted to do precisely this, to talk about the experiences of connecting back with the home countries. So hopefully at least that is one avenue for engaging with that. Thank you. Well, um, 
for me, I, I'm, an, I'm an international student, and uh, I have an F1 visa, which is expiring very soon. <laughs> but uh, uh, as an international student, in my point of view, I, I, think, I think it's important to uh, get experience and then go back to, to Kenya. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Getting experience here and then go back to help the, uh, the economy back in Kenya. Because uh, if you think about it, the U.S. is one of the, you know, it's the best economy in the world. So this is where you get all the connections you really need to get that knowledge, uh, to go back and kind of share that knowledge with the, with the, with the other people on the other side. So my, my desire is always to get the knowledge and then go back and give back to the people back then. But most of my, uh, my friends were international. Most of them want to stay here, uh, be a citizen, uh, and maybe just go back and forth and visit. But, you know, my, for me, I feel like it's, it's, it's really necessary for me to go back uh, and just give back to, to my community uh, and, and also, uh, I, I, you know, I think that's, that's how I'm thinking about it. Thank you. We have time for one more question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have difficulty standing, so if it's okay. All right. Uh, I have found this to be so powerful and would wondered if you all have a strategic plan or some sort in place to magnify what we've witnessed today. The key is seeing how many of the diaspora have invested in the American life and poured years into the United States, but just a longing for their country. And I would love to continue to hear about the library in Grenada and all the different things that you're, you're caring about, but it needs to stay in our presence. And I'm asking how you're going to do that. So I'll give you two. Um, I'll give you two quick answers on that, and anyone else can chime in. W one of the things that we did prior to this tour at the Office of Global Partnerships is we hosted a global diaspora forum at the State Department every spring. That that took place se for several years before I arrived there. We're doing this instead. We will have a discussion about, you know, when, once we get done with the next few weeks, whether we try and do that again next year and sort of reconvene people in a big way and have big discussions about it. This year we wanted to have small discussions like we're doing now. Um, the other thing that we do is we take our office again through the um, secretary. We take delegation trips um, around the world to different places. Uh, they're usually economic based, but they can be cultural. They can be conducted for any number of reasons. One of the things we try to push in that is bring diasporans on those trips so that they can see firsthand um, what goes on in the country of origin. So we'll try to scale that up over the, over the next several months too. So I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. But a, a strategic plan is always a good thing. Sarah. I, maybe I can give my shameless plug now. Shameless um, plug. <laughs> So Global Diaspora Week, which a special rep mentioned at the beginning of the event and invited people to host their own events, I realize we're about 10 days out from Global Diaspora Week, so that may not be feasible at this point, but we have over 65 events taking place around the world, mostly concentrated in this area with online events as well. So you can go to our website, which is diasporaalliance.org, and look at the listing and see what you might want to participate in. An idea is dedicated like writ large dedicated to engaging with diaspora communities and spreading the word about the work that they're doing in, in communities here and communities back home. So if you stay engaged with us, you'll be able to follow up on projects like these and uh, learn about what these folks are doing. And one more. Hi, and this is Connie. I'm also in Jew's office. And just one last thing, too, is that diasporaidea.org down here will also, our office is going to be putting together like a synopsis of everything, everybody who's been involved here, Samar's work, you know, Rafiki Beats, the library project, David's work, everything. We'll put a synopsis together so that you can also see who's doing what, who's been on the tour, and how you can contact them or go to their websites. Well, thank you. I have to give one shout out to my longtime colleague in the Senate and now the State Department, Alexandra Costello, formerly Nunez, who is a University of Maryland graduate. So she joined us today. She is one of the secretary's liaisons to Capitol Hill. So. And the diaspora. And the diaspora, yeah. So, and for our panel. Thank you, everybody for taking time out of the middle of your day. Global Diaspora Week is in about 10 days, so check out the websites and be in touch with us and we'll all stick around for a few minutes. So thank you very much.